get going. So it's one minute past 10. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us and, and sending you a warm welcome to everyone here um, with us today. Um, this is our second webinar for our Research and Evaluation Network this year. Um, so the theme of today's webinar is Human Research Ethics Committees and their role in the community services sector. Um, so we are a smaller group today um, with 54 registrations for today's event. Um, so for the agenda, I'll just change slides. Um, so I'm going to give a 10 minute introduction um, and overview of our network and tell you a bit more about our research and evaluation forum um, and our draft plan for the network for 2023. Um, I'm then going to hand over to our guest speaker for today's event, uh, Megan Borlais, who will give the presentation on Human Research Ethics Committees. Um, there will be some time for some Q&A after Megan's presentation, um, and I will also highlight some upcoming opportunities that you may like to get involved with. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things to note. Um, by default, you will be on mute, but your camera will be turned on. Um, so this session will be recorded. Um, if you don't want your face shown in the recording, please feel free to turn your camera off now. Um, if during Q&A you'd like to ask a question, you can write the question in the chat. Um, there's also a Q&A function here, um, but I would just suggest using the chat. Um, the other option is you can put your hand up by using the raise your hand emoji um, and then take yourself off mute at the, um, to ask the question. Um, so yeah, please feel free to introduce yourself and, and what organisation you work for. Um, so it's easier for us and for Megan to tailor her responses accordingly. Um, if we do run out of time uh, with the Q&A, we can follow up with you individually after the session. Um, so yeah, just pop your question into the chat pane. Um, so I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of this land, um, the oldest living continuing cultures in human history. I acknowledge the Yuggera and Turrbal people of the lands on which I work here and live in Mianjin in Brisbane. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to all First Nations colleagues joining us online today. Uh, QCOS thanks First Nations people for the gift of the Uluru Statement from the heart. We look forward to supporting work leading to a successful referendum to enshrine First Nations voice to Parliament in the Australian Constitution, followed by Makarada and Treaty. QCOS welcomes the invitation to walk with First Nations peoples in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Uh, so for those online, please feel free to join us in acknowledging country where you are today um, through the chat function as well. Uh, so my name is Amy Dellett. Um, I'm the data and reporting analyst in the research and policy team at QCOS, uh, and I coordinate these research and evaluation network webinars in our online forum. Uh, so the purpose of the research and evaluation network, um, so since our webinar last month, uh, we've reviewed and updated our terms of reference uh, for the network. Um, and so we invite you to also uh, review the terms of reference, um, which will be sent out with the post uh, webinar email resources from today. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch or provide any feedback on the updated terms of reference, um, our team's email address is research at qcost.org.au. Um, so a quick overview um, for those who may be new to the network, um, the purpose of the research evaluation network is about um, collaboration and knowledge sharing with the intention of identifying shared challenges and emerging issues in the community services sector, which allows us to then respond and provide advice on matters relating to research and evaluation. Uh, it's also an opportunity to share perspectives and shape the QCOS research and evaluation agenda. Um, so you can now also access um, our research and evaluation network webinar recordings um, and resources on our community door research and evaluation resources hub page. Um, and so you can access the page by clicking um, the link on this slide and I'll share the link in the chat pane too. Sorry, just taking a second to pull up my chat window. And I'm sharing that now. Um, so as mentioned, we um, we have a QCOS research and evaluation forum. Sorry, my slide's updating. Um, and that sits within the Microsoft Teams platform. Uh, currently we have 52 members and guests on the forum. 
Um, and the idea behind the forum is that we are providing a space and an opportunity for our network members to collaborate and exchange ideas um, and to access professional development opportunities. Um, it's also the best way to stay up to date with the news about the network and our network webinars. Um, so to join the forum, it's a two-step process. Um, so if you haven't done this already, um, you can submit to re a request to join the forum through the QCOS website um, and using the EOI link, which um, I'll also pop into the chat. Um, and when we receive this request form, we'll add you as a guest user, and then um, I'll send you a welcome message to the forum as well. Um, so that's the link in the chat now to the forum if you're interested in joining. Um, so um, for the users that are already on the forum, you may or may not want to turn or check uh, your notification settings so that you receive alerts about when people are posting to the forum. Um, so you can change your notification settings or preferences in two different ways. So either by clicking on the three dots next to your avatar in the top right hand corner of your teams um, or the three dots on the right hand side of your screen next to the little I symbol. Um, so also I thought I'd briefly, briefly mention um, from time to time, um, I will post polls on the forum to get feedback on different activities being organized for the network. Um, so at the moment I have a poll running um, in the ideas and feedback channel um, about organizing like a more informal catch up with network members. Um, and this can just be a general online meet and greet, um, or we can invite members to share information on the data projects that you're currently working on. Um, thank you to the one person so far who has responded. Um, so I'm going to share the poll link with you now all as well, if you're interested in more informal catch up, like a meeting style. Um, and hopefully that works with people who are outside the forum platform too. I did have a message this morning saying the link wasn't working. Um, so I might need to look at a different um, polling option, um, but yeah, see how we go with that. And if you have any issues, I am aware it might not work. <laughs> so um, I'll try a different option next time too. Um, so also, um, this is the last slide from me um, before I hand it over to Megan. Um, this is the draft plan for the network for 2023. Uh, so our next webinar is in April, uh, which was postponed from last year and it's around data governance. Um, we also have a session planned on automated decision making and its relevance to the sector. Um, we'll have a session on data culture, strategy and evaluation leadership in May. Um, and then Megan is coming back to join us for a second time in August um, for an overview on evaluation resources and frameworks. Um, further on the horizon for September, we're also finalising some guest speakers for topics around data visualisation, data storytelling and communicating impact. Um, and we'll also have a topic on qualitative research methodologies and evaluating collaboration and partnerships. Um, so it's shaping up to be a very busy year ahead. Um, we're also exploring opportunities for webinars on culturally safe research and evaluation methodologies and data management and documentation. Um, I know there was a really high interest in both of these topics. Um, so if we can't fit them in this year, um, we'll definitely aim to have them ready for early next year. Um, and I guess my intention is also to weave First Nations, people's voices and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander excellence um, resources and research throughout all of the webinar topics and content rather than just as a focus in one webinar. Um, so now I'm going to, uh, sorry, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's event, um, Dr. Megan Borlase, Chief of Info Innovation Research and Partnerships at Logic Institute. Uh, so Megan has her uh, postgraduate degrees in psychology and applied behaviour analysis. Um, she's spent her adult life working in disability support services in England, New Zealand, Australia and the USA. Um, she completed her doctorate in ABA in 2015 at Caldwell University, New Jersey in USA. Um, and she has been a board certified behaviour analyst since 2013. She's an experienced presenter and has worked as a supervisor and trainer for over 10 years. And Megan has completed the foundations of directorship from the Australian Institute of Company Directors um, and works as part of an executive team. Megan has presented her research at international and domestic conferences and has research published in the Journal of Applied Behaviour Analysis. Um, she oversees research development 
and Learning and Delivery and Con Consultancy at Logic Institute, where their mission is intentional influence. Um, so I had the pleasure of um, connecting with Megan um, last year at our QCOS conference. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to Megan's presentation today around human research ethics committees um, and exploring the opportunity to engage in these conversations further um, about the vision for the future of re uh, human research ethics committees and their role in the community services sector. Um, at the end of Megan's presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, so I'll now hand it over to Megan. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Amy. So I will share mine. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk about this topic and hopefully we get some good discussion and questions going at the end. I'm going to try and get this through in about 30 minutes so that we have you know, a good 10 to 15 minutes to chat when it's said and done. And there's my contact information will be at the end in case anyone would like to follow up with me directly after. So what I'm going to talk about is a bit of background around ethics review um, in the community sector and in general. One of the problems that we see around this in relation to the community sector, a solution that we've come up with personally um, that may apply to other people um, that might help you guys come up with a solution for yourselves as well. Um, what we anticipate the impact being of said solution and a call to action for anyone who wants to get involved in the work that we are doing personally. So a bit of background. I found this quote and I just thought it was a nice sort of starting point. Any tool can be used for good or bad. It's really the ethics of the artist using it. And for me, that just means, you know, anything that we do can go either way. But if we go at it from a point of view of having an ethics and moral um, standpoint, then it's more likely to go down the good track. So when I'm talking about research ethics in this context, it's human research. Um, anything to do with humans, their tissue, their data. Obviously for us, that's more about their data and the person themselves rather than their tissue, but it was in the website. Um, the National Health and Medical Research Council, the NHMRC, are the group, body of people who basically oversee research in Australia, uh, along with um, the Australian Research Council and the Universities of Australia. They set most of the guidelines and everything. And they present research ethics as an ethos that should permeate the way those engaged in human research approach all that they do in their research. In the Australian Code of Research, they say that the Australian and international community expects research to be conducted responsibly, ethically, and with integrity. And I'll talk a little bit shortly about why that matters um, with some examples of things that have been done in the past that are a little bit less than desirable, like a lot less than desirable. Um, most of the stuff that we do, most of the research that occurs here in Australia, there's not a ton of risk. It's generally carried out safely in a safe and ethical manner, but there are risks. There are risks for discomfort. There's risks for privacy being breached. There are risks potentially for harm, depending on what exactly you're doing. So it's important that we have the right frameworks and the right methodologies to ensure that those risks are minimized and managed. Pretty much anyone who's participating in research, they just need to know that they can trust you to protect them. Because generally, when we're doing research, the people who are participating, they're not necessarily getting a lot of benefits. It's not something that they're getting paid a ton of money to do. They're doing it out of the goodness of their own heart to help further our knowledge and understanding of different parts of the world and the way that things work for people. So they need to know that they can trust the researcher to take care of them and to look out for them. And that's the responsibility of the researcher and the institute primarily. The people who help them determine whether or not they're doing the right thing are those ethics committees. So 
So this just gives a little bit of a brief overview of some of the worst examples of research that's been done without any concern for ethics. Um, you have the likes of Joseph Mengele at Auschwitz, where he was engaging in a bunch of inhumane experiments on prisoners that resulted in long-term disability, death. The man was known as the angel of death, and his favorite people to experiment on were people with disability and children. Henry Murray was part of a, he worked on a study for the CIA, where he basically tormented undergraduate students degraded them, called them names, said all kinds of horrible things to them, videotaped it, and then made them watch themselves being degraded over and over and over and over and over again. And one of the people who participated in that study was Ted Kaczynski, who ended up becoming the Unibomber. In Tzatziki, in America, from 1932 to 72, the government selected 399 poor individuals, generally from African-American descent, who had syphilis, and then tracked the effects that syphilis had on them without ever providing any treatment, even after the discovery that penicillin worked in 1947, sat back, watched, watched as syphilis was passed to their children, passed to their spouses as people died, and did absolutely nothing to help them. In the Stanford Prison Experiment, another university-based experiment. This experiment got so bad, they only let it run for six days. They had participants who were considered guards, participants who were considered prisoners, and they allowed the guards to do whatever needed to be done in order to get information out of the prisoners, resulting in high levels of psychological torture towards the prisoners, and the prisoners just accepting what was happening to them. And the last one that I have in here is the Milgram experiment from Yale, where they had a person in the room who was required, instructed to ask someone they couldn't see a bunch of questions. And if the person got the question wrong, they were to push a button delivering an electric shock to the other person. There was no electric shock actually occurring, but they could hear that person reacting to the electric shock. So in their mind, they were hurting the other individual and they did not stop until they were told to stop largely because they were informed, like, it's okay, there won't be any permanent damage. So they just continued on orders. Now, as you can see, these all date prior to the 70s. There are more recent examples. These are just the most, I guess, horrific ones that come up when you look up, why do we need research ethics? These are some of the big ones that kind of come through. So as I mentioned earlier, we have the HMRC, NHMRC, who they are considered the leading expert health body in health and medical research. They set themselves high standards of integrity and scientific rigor and see themselves as the champion, as championing the pursuit of better health outcomes for all Australians. So they are responsible in partnership with the Australian Research Council and Universities of Australia to set the guidelines for research and evaluation for people here in Australia. So any organisation that's wanting to engage in research and evaluation should be following the guidelines set by these organizations. These are some of those guidelines, and I believe I sent the links to most of these to Amy to share with you all in the chat. The national statement is probably the big one. That's uh, that one in the Australian code, really, they form the backbone of the research governance for any organization or university. There's two guidelines included in here that relate specifically to research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They're very important to include um, when you're looking at this work, especially in Queensland, where there is such a large population of First Nations individuals. Um, and in the last one that's there, that relates more to, so this is specifically about quality assurance or evaluation activities. So those first four address mainly research. The last one is about evaluation because the two things are kind of treated differently, but they're under the same general umbrella. So there should be ethic review done for any of any research or evaluation. If you're wanting to, so in the evaluations, it's if you're wanting to disseminate that, 
Um, but they're not always painted with the same brush. So an ethics review, basically, you as a researcher, you come up with a proposal of how you want to go through what sort of research you want to do. You look at the risks, the benefits, you create an entire sort of application and then you submit it to an ethics review committee. They go through and they go like, OK, well, we can see here that you've managed the risk around privacy. It looks like there is a risk that this person might um, be inconvenienced. OK, that's not so bad. Oh, here there's a risk that there might be some kind of psychological harm. This may be very anxiety provoking for them or distressing. They try to see, you know, what are the risks to the people? How have you managed for those? How have you accounted for them? What kind of supports are you providing? If your research is going to trigger anxiety, how are you going to then help that person manage their anxiety that's resulted from that? Do they get debriefed? Do they have access to, you know, therapeutic support, for example, to help deal with their anxiety? Like, what have you done to help protect that person? How are their rights being looked after? How are they being treated? What are the benefits that they receive from taking part? as well and they kind of balance all of that out and they give you feedback on whether or not those processes really do protect the person how you could change them to make sure that person is properly protected what monitoring needs to be done to make sure that you are sticking to the processes that you would stick said you would stick to and things like that they also do that in relation to evaluation so and i'm going to explain what that is and in a later slide and how that's sort of different from the research but they do it for research and they also do it for evaluation they are the people that any ethics breaches get reported to and then they take actions that may be anything from talking to you about how to change the processes to make sure it doesn't happen again to revoking your um, approvals until certain things are addressed or basically shutting down the entire study because it's no longer meeting ethics requirements and the, the participants are not in a safe environment within that research study. So they they don't um, commission research, they don't design the research, they're just there to make sure that that research is protect is going to do its best to protect the client, the, protect the participant and keep them as safe as possible and is following ethics. Um, there's generally a system for complaints, like managing complaints that's related to research ethics that sits within an ethics review committee as well. So their purpose, first and foremost, protect the people participating in research and evaluation. That is one of their primary goals. They're there to make sure that we don't end up with another Taziki or Milgram or Mengele. Um, we don't, it's to ensure the integrity of research and evaluation. It's a step towards publication and dissemination of the work we're doing and it's to ensure that you're aligning with research governance as outlined by those groups that I spoke of earlier. So in research and evaluation there's kind of four risk levels. So quality assurance, the risks should be identical to what is already in existence within normal service delivery or in normal human resources activities. So if you are doing a quality insurance project around your staff, the risk to those staff that are part of that quality assurance should be no different to the risks involved in being a, your employee in the first place. Same thing if it's a person that you support that's involved in that, the risk that occurs to them is exactly the same as it would be in just their standard service delivery. Nothing's changed. You're literally just evaluating what happens in that situation. The next level up is negligible risk. That is talking about risk of inconvenience. Low risk is a risk of discomfort, like, oh, I'm not really, I don't really like this, but I can survive, I'm not getting hurt. High risk is anything greater than discomfort. And that relates specifically to just adults, regular, everyday, doesn't have any risk, like no registered diagnosis, no, um, Register like no listed mental health concern. They don't come from a particular cultural background, so they're not First Nations, for example. They're not considered a high risk group. So high risk also covers specific groups, children, pregnant women, First Nations individuals. There's 
multiple groups that fall into the high risk just because of their background or age. Um, an ethics group can review low risk, negligible risk and, and quality assurance. High risk, which is where all virtually all the people we support in the human and community services fall, has to be reviewed by a human research ethics committee and their committee who are registered under the NHMRC. So quality assurance, you're looking at just evaluating the participants existing environment to understand the effects. So you're looking at what is the impact or effect of what I'm doing in their service on them. If I'm in implementing some kind of strategy to decrease a behavior of concern, is that having the delayed impact? And I'm doing nothing else. I'm just doing what I was going to be doing and the service that they requested me to provide. There's no increase in the risks based on the service. You have a consent. So your service consent includes the use of evaluation. That's sufficient consent for that level. Ethics approval is sought after you are finished doing the evaluation. So for example, a case review might fall into a quality assurance. Whereas research, you are changing something in their environment to test the effects. There are increased risks above those existing in services. You need to get additional consent for them to take part in research. You have to have research, you have to have ethics approval before you start recruiting your participants or engaging in the study. And that approval involves doing a full literature review and a bunch of in-depth planning as part of that process. So it takes a long time to be able to start a research project versus evaluation where you're just looking at what you're already doing as part of the service. So as a general rule in human and community services, what we are more likely to be doing is evaluating our service, evaluating our staff processes. What most human research ethics committees are reviewing is research. When we've been looking at this to try and determine how we can get our evaluation into publications and disseminated, we come up against the block that a lot of HRECs don't review quality assurance, they review research, which means you need to do that process first. Most of the clients that people work with don't have time to wait three months for you to go through the whole planning process and approval process or potentially longer before you start providing services. So it's not really an option. What's going to benefit the industry the most? Both. We really need both. So the HRECs, the Human Research Ethics Committees, they have to meet very specific governance requirements under the NHMRC. There's annual reporting requirements. They can review any risk level, whereas, as I said before, other groups can account review high risk. They have minimum membership requirements, which I'll talk about at the end. There's minimum education requirements around research ethics. Key dates and, pub, um, and documents are published on their websites. And at this time, they largely exist in universities research institutes and some large service providers. So there are private HRECs out there, um, but predominantly it's something that sits in just about every university. And there are a few large service providers like CPL and Scope and I think Uniting Care. Um, they all have an HREC at this time. So for us, the problem that we've kind of identified as we've been trying to go through and start doing some real research, if we don't actually do research ethic reviews, well, we can't publish. A lot of research publications, particularly like academic journals, need proof that a paper has been through an ethics review process prior to being accepted. There are more conferences asking for the same, particularly international conferences. And if we can't get our research and evaluation into those official dissemination challenges, then it's really hard for us to show the really cool and exciting innovations and things that we're engaging in and the, the things that work for our industry to academia who can do it on a larger research scale, to the government who need to know what's working so that they can help set the agenda, so that they can make sure that funding is going to the right kind of activities, they can change the requirements for the industry to other parts of the industry so that more people than just us are doing it, more people are supporting those innovations, the things that are working well for the people that we support, and to funding bodies, the people like the NDIA, 
who provide the insurance funding if they don't know what they should be funding because we can't show them what works really well and is having a good impact then it makes it very difficult and instead of us getting to set that agenda these guys are setting the agenda and they're telling us what needs to be done instead of the other way around when we're the people who know best so what are we wanting to get done we would love to see a lot more research and evaluation occurring in a service delivery setting like at that organizational level rather than at the higher level only we would love to see that being published and presented and us guiding the government more in setting and determining what is best practice influencing the industry to help them see the way that needs to go forward things like this network and the forum and stuff that helps but if we can get this out into more mainstream channels like academic journals, that's going to help even more. We want to create an evidence base for what we do that directly relates to the populations we work with. There's a ton of research out there in certain areas for America, for example, not as much for Australia. And we're hoping that by doing all these things, academia, government, research institutes, we'll start researching the things that we say matter for us and the people that we support rather than the things that they assume matter. So some of the barriers that we're coming up against. Time. We have so much to do in so little time and this is not a quick and easy process. Generally, the easiest process is to be evaluating the stuff that we're already doing anyway. To do that, you need frameworks, you need access to ethics that ethics reviews that will look at that quality assurance level. Expertise. We don't have always the best expertise in our organizations around evaluation and research. We need to have access to things like this network where we can get professional development opportunities to learn more about that, to learn more about the standards and the um, guidelines and the requirements and streamline our processes. It can be expensive. Having someone in your organization who's just dedicated to doing something like this is not cheap. When you are trying to get HREC review, there are private HRECs who will review for other organizations. They can be extremely expensive. It can be several thousand dollars per project just for one review. It can be difficult to help HRECs understand the needs of the industry and the kind of thing that you're doing. So a lot of, for example, university-based HRECs, they understand very well how research works in academia. They have that down. They are fantastic. When we do research in service delivery in organizations, it's very hard to control the different variables. There are challenges that exist that, you know, cannot be communicated. And we need to be able to do those evaluations, not reviewing research as a whole. We don't have time to do the whole background thing. We just want to evaluate and show that the work that we did with this client, this person we support is so good that it's going to be reused to other people. And having them review something that doesn't really fit in their wheelhouse can be really difficult or finding an HREC who is able or willing to do that can be hard. And the last thing is it can just be very challenging trying to do research and evaluation in the types of city settings that we work in. So one solution that we have come up with is the idea of establishing a community based ethics group. So we're talking about having an ethics group where the members are from the human and community services sector. And they're responsible for evaluating research that's being conducted in the human and community services sector. So they understand the challenges because they work in that area. They've experienced that area. And anyone from within the sector, whether it's a small organization or a larger organization, can submit their evaluation or their research to get reviewed. It, ha it has all the research governance arrangements in place that are required. And it's set up in line with the Australian Research Code and the NHM MRC national standards. Basically, to minimize cost, it's going to be a case of members receiving orientation training. There'll be a sitting fee. 
It's held through Microsoft Teams, so that reduces a lot of costs around travel, organizing meeting locations, etc. All of submission deadlines and everything will be available on a website along with key documents so that anyone can access that. Anyone in the sector can submit for review at a nominal fee, so they don't need to be a linked associated to the organization. They don't have to be um, engaging in research that involves participants or from that associate, that organization. They just need basically to be part of the industry and wanting to do some kind of research or evaluation. Um, they'll receive a notification of outcome in writing from the chairperson and the ethics group will outline monitoring requirements of that research project and monitor the ethics of that research project. So we've set one of these up in Logic. We are, we now have a really fantastic individual who's agreed to be our chairperson, who is a highly sought after disability advocate and he's, um, a qualified uh, quality assessor, and he's going to be absolutely fantastic to lead this organize, um, lead this this group. What has this involved? So so far, we have established all the research governance, set out our group terms of reference, and our group operating procedures. And now I'm referring to it as a group because it's not registered as a committee at this time. We need to have our members before we can register. Um. Now is about recruiting members to join, starting our meetings, taking submissions, and in the future we will be applying to get registered as an HREC so that we can cover all of those levels of risk, continuing our meetings, and then monitoring all of our approved projects. So in order to get HREC registration, we had to have those terms of reference, operating procedures, recruit members um, against those HREC requirements, provide members with training, publish our schedules, and then start running meetings and apply and hope that they say yes. In terms of the makeup of an HREC, you have a chairperson, you have lay people, people with no legal, medical, academic, or scientific work that they're engaged in, uh, people currently working in professional care, counseling, treatment of people, pastoral care, so an Aboriginal elder, for example, a minister, and we do have someone who we've approached about joining the ethics group who seems to be very keen on doing so, who's um, he's a, a desert elder. Uh, and he's at this stage said that he would be interested in joining that group. A lawyer who's ideally not engaged with um, our organization and then people with current research experience relevant to the proposals being assessed. So another person that's agreed to join us at this stage is um, from the University of Technology, Sydney, and does a lot of research in particularly with children and uh, education. So what is our anticipated impact? We're hoping this will help smash down that wall and those barriers a little bit, uh, making it more affordable, giving people an accessible way to review their, uh, their research and evaluation by people who kind of understand more of that, the challenges and things that they face. So, and the idea is, is that this will allow us to do more service research to allow the sector to guide the agenda for the government, for the academics, and get a higher level of dissemination coming out of the sector itself rather than about the sector. So a call to action, and this call to action relates specifically to our ethics group, but really the call to action I want to make is that you look at the stuff that you're doing in terms of research and evaluation and you consider taking that to an ethics committee and, and disseminating the things that you're doing. Like it doesn't need to be our ethics group. You don't need to get involved with us. I would love it if you did. But really, I would just, we would love to see the sector stepping up and doing more to get the amazing things that they're doing out in front of a larger group of people. So if you would like to join our ethics group, just um, send us a cover letter and a CV. We'll be happy to have a look at that and consider your participation. We don't really have a limit on the number of members that we're accepting. We have to have a set number of people attend each meeting, but you know that doesn't have to be the same group every single time. And I've sent this to Amy so that she can um, share that with everyone after the fact for anyone who wants to have this information. 
if you would like to have a project reviewed, feel free to contact us. If you've got any questions about the process or anything, you're more, more than welcome to contact us. And um, I've just chucked up on here our social media website and my personal contact in case you'd like to follow up with anything. I'm more than happy to chat about it. Um, like I said, all that we really want to see is that the sector has a chance to really start taking more control over the research agenda that's occurring in the human and community services. Um, instead of everything being directed at that higher level more, it would be really awesome if we could start getting more research out there and taking control and telling the big organizations, the universities, the government, this is what we care about. This is what we want you to research. So thank you for your time and for listening to me. And I'm going to stop sharing now so that Amy can take control back. So if anyone has any questions or is there anything in the chat? Um, so, yeah, we didn't receive any. Oh, thanks, Megan. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Um, yeah, we didn't receive any webinar questions um, like beforehand um, from people who registered for today's session. Um, but it looks like we've got some comments and questions coming through. Um, so Tanya's asking, is the logic group already taking projects for review? Uh, so we aren't just yet we're pretty close we just need to finalize we need a few a couple more members before we can start our intention is in the next probably month to actually have that sort of base group organized so that we can start running some meetings and we'll be posting some stuff on the website and through our social media to let everyone know hey when you're ready to submit start chucking them in this is our upcoming meeting schedule so that you guys can um send things in for review yeah that's a great great question <laughs> um we had another comment as well um so dr robin um she's saying thanks megan um it's great to see an ethics committee um being established for our sector so that's exciting positive feedback um was, yeah another comment amazing initiative have been wishing for this for years <laughs> so um that's also really exciting um any, yeah, if anyone else wants to um, comment, just provide it in the chat. Um, I guess I thought I would share also, um, you know, some overall reflections from me. And I just think, um, you know, thank you so much. I have, um, I've learned so much just by being involved with organising this webinar. Um, so I think it was really interesting how you covered, you know, just understanding the, the levels of risk and how that's considered. Um, I had an interesting conversation with um, Scott yesterday, who's our Director for Research and Policy at QCOS. Um, and yeah, it was interesting because there was a lot of parallels. He was kind of talking to me around um, or describing the process. It's like basically, you know, having um, an ethics review. Um, it's, it's similar to like a peer review if you're publishing a journal, but it's, you know, it's you complete it at the start of the process rather than at the end. Um, and he was also doing like a distinguishing, I think, how you covered in the um, the quality and assurance or versus research slide, um, saying, you know, that there's this distinction between research and evaluation. And I've always considered that they were the same thing, you know, like you would do evaluation as part of the research process. So it's really interesting to see how that is defined in this process and um, that the research is, is really around like discovering new knowledge. Um, so that were kind of my reflections. It was really interesting to find out that a lot of the, you know, the human research ethics committees that are established, um, they don't, you know, generally accept or review those evaluation projects, um, you know, for various reasons that you, that you mentioned. You know, so a lot of the hospital and health services in Queensland, they have, um, ethics committees, but they don't review the evaluations. I think it's really interesting, like just differentiating between, you know, establishing an ethics group or a steering committee um, versus an actual like um, human research ethics committee. Um, so, yeah, it was really great that you've kind of gone through all of that. Um, so I'll just check again with any other questions that have come through. Um, 
Um, so a comment from Jemima saying, thanks, Megan. That was a good presentation. I'm pleased to hear Logic Group is setting up a her herrick. I agree we need more accessible herricks. A question from me is what is the nominal fee for a herrick review? So I can't give you a specific figure because we're still trying to work out the exact costs, but basically for us, it's what we call our break even. So basically it just seems to cover our costs plus 10% just for any of those sort of incidentals or changes in cost across that year. Um, we don't want it. We're not using this or trying to do this in order to make any kind of profit. We just need to be able to make it that we can afford to do it, but we're doing our best to make it as affordable as we can for the sector as well. Like we know that when we've been looking at doing this, the cost for going out and doing this with another HRC has been prohibitive and we don't want ours to be prohibitive. We want to make this as accessible as we can. So we're trying to keep those costs as minimal as we can, which is why we're doing things like keeping it on teams rather than trying to have face-to-face -face meetings where we have to bring people together. We are yeah, working on having it as low cost as possible. But the main thing is it has to cover the cost to us as well as just a little bit extra to cushion us for any of those uh, inflation changes that can occur. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good to be transparent about that process too. I think that covers Alvin's question as well. He's, say, he's saying, um, hi, Megan, with Herrick assist with uh, internal governmental policy work with peak bodies in Queensland or only fee for pay of our basis? Um, can you see the comments honest, as well? Yeah, yeah, I can. Cool. I'm just trying to think. It's yeah. not something that we've discussed. Um, because I, like, to be honest, I'm not 100% certain what you're talking about in terms of intergovernmental policy work with peak bodies. We're pretty open to having discussions around whatever the sector needs. So if there are areas like that that will be of benefit to the sector, you know, that's, as I mentioned, like our mission is intentional influence, or as Amy said in um, the bio, like that's our, our mission. So for us, we want to try and do as much as we can to for the good of the sector. Um, if there are things like that, that there's going to be a lot of things that we haven't really thought about. Um, we've kind of gone, okay, these are the, the, the barriers and the issues that we've come up against. This is the stuff that we're struggling with. So that's what we've set it up based on. I am more than happy for you to contact me about any other ideas or ways that we could potentially direct this to help it create as much accessibility and usability for the sector as possible. So, you know, feel free to reach out um, to discuss that further if you'd like. That's great. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I think iterative process sometimes, you know, it's all kind of like establishing something that's new that doesn't exist. So it's all a bit of a work in progress and a, a learning opportunity too. So um, yeah, Alvin, definitely reach out to Megan if, if you want to discuss further. Um, we've also got a comment from Tanya. Um, could you share with us other existing herricks that the community sector could use potentially? Um, our grants program sometimes gets applications that really should go through a herrick, but as you've identified, do not have an in-house herrick. So I will just share this link here into the chat. So the link I've just put up, that links to the information on the NHMRC website relating to HRECs. It includes in there a document that lists every registered HREC in Australia. So hopefully that can help you. Yeah, I think I posted that um, previously as well, but I did post a lot of links so it might have got lost. I was interested when I looked through it. So yeah, there's 31 um, listed in Queensland, but a lot of them are hospital health services. There was, I think, three that were community organisations, but they only, my understanding is that they only review like um, clients who are accessing those particular services, uh, not more broadly to the whole sector. Um, so I think we've got probably about two or three minutes left um, with questions. 
Um, I thought I would actually point out also, you know, that we have, you, you mentioned earlier um, around the role of First Nations communities being involved with the process. Um, and we do have First Nations colleagues online today, um, as well as community controlled organisations like Quake. Um, and so uh, we have colleagues from universities as well who are undertaking research um, in cross-cultural evaluation and culturally um, safe evaluation. Um, so I, don't know, I thought it was a really great opportunity to start, you know, connecting everyone together and having these conversations. Um, and so my question was around, you know, how do you see the role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research Ethics Committees and working with the ethics group you are proposing? Like, do you think there's a need for both um, and there's scope for both? Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what others think as well, um, as well as, you know, how would the ethics group incorporate First Nations research guidelines? Um, I know you touched on the NHMRC guidelines quite a bit already too. Um, and Quake has almost also commented. Um, so Anna's saying, um, the Quake research team has just uh, very recently had a 12 month um, scoping grant project approved to look at establishing a First Nations Ethics Committee um, and all research governance group in Queensland. Um, so yeah, she's saying she'd, uh, it would be great to discuss um, with yourself and other stakeholders um, within this group further down the track. So yeah, that's sorry, that's a, <laughs> a lot of qu questions and comments to put at you at once, but um, yeah, how would you like to respond? I, I did message Anna back and said I would love to discuss that. Oh. I imagine there'd be other people who would also love to talk about that as well. It sounds really exciting. Um, in terms of First Nations, one of the things that we're trying to do is ensure that we have a nice, diverse group of members. Um, as I mentioned, we do have somebody from a First Nations background uh, that's very interested in joining the group. So we'll be relying on him to help guide us in that space. Um, one of the links that I believe you shared earlier, Amy, talks about uh, the, I think it's about seven First Nations um, HRECs in Australia. Some are state specific, a couple are, I think, more national that you can access as well. I think one of the big differences in relation to how you work with people from First Nations in a research space is that the the knowledge and the information and the data that you collect that belongs to the community, to the First Nations community. It doesn't belong to the individual the same way as it does for you or I. Um, so where like I can consent to share my data and then you don't really have to get any other kind of permissions or consents to share my data. If you're done some work or evaluation or research with someone from the First Nations background, not only do you need their consent for them to be involved, you also then need to get consent from the, their community on how you can then disseminate that information and, and their willingness for that information to be shared because it, it belongs to the community as a whole, not just to them as an individual. Um, so there, there needs to be a lot of community involvement when you're doing research and evaluations with people from a First Nations background. I think for us, a key part of us helping to navigate that is ensuring that we do have people from a First Nations background involved directly with our ethics group to help us, like help guide us on that journey so that we don't make too many missteps. Um, that's Hopefully great. That Thank you. Questions. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> no, it's really good. I think it's great to just have those considerations in mind as well. Um, so I think it as well. It brought to mind. Um, I did share the resource in the link as well. Um, there, I watched a, a webinar on Monday this week. It was around um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research um, and ethics and reciprocity. Um, so I shared that link in the as the recording was shared. Um, I thought it was a really great resource because it kind of outlined um, from Dr. Summer May Finlay. Um, you may uh, know of her. Um, she's the co-chair of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council um, of New South Wales Ethics Committee, and she outlined some really important considerations when you know undertaking research and applying for ethics. Um, you know, as well as a high level overview of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Human Research Ethics Committees across the different states and territories. So I'd really recommend, um, you know, colleagues watching that recording as well, just to be informed of, of that perspective. Um, we've got time 
probably mm, one more question, I think, and then we'll need to start wrapping up. So um, we might need to take some of these comments offline. Um, so Stephanie's saying um, it would be great if there was uh, the possibility to get some initial advice from this committee on potential projects. Um, for example, I'm wondering how complex and detailed an evaluation would need to be to warrant an ethics application, etc. So I'm absolutely happy to chat about that. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, I think, I don't know if Amy, you've shared my email in the chat or not, but you're more than welcome to get in touch with me. Basically an evaluation, like you can do an evaluation in your service without needing to get ethics review. You need the ethics review if you want to share the outcomes of that evaluation with other people. When um, when I come back and join you guys in August to chat, it will be looking at frameworks and ways that we can do evaluation that are more likely to lead to the quality of work that needs to then um, that you know will be publishable, I guess. So it meets certain data requirements and things that journals and stuff are more likely to kind of accept and um, more likely to publish than some of the stuff that we may necessarily be doing just to help guide some of that and doing so while in keeping with the evaluation guidelines, the quality assurance guidelines that are coming out from the NHMRC. But definitely feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to have a chat with people um, on this stuff outside of this, so. Thanks so much. I just tried to share a link and then it did, <laughs> didn't work. So uh, Robin's saying, can you please share the Logic website details? Um, we'll send all of the contact details out at the end of the webinar as well. Um, so I will just um, say, you know, thank you so much for your generous um, generosity with your time and your and sharing your knowledge on this topic. Um, we really appreciate your enthusiasm, um, you know, reaching out to us and, you know, sharing and connecting um, with this network. Um, we look forward to continuing to contribute and refine some of these conversations and, um, you know, anticipate updates of how the ethics group and committee tracks. Um, so before I uh, we go, I wanted to share um, just some upcoming QCOS webinars and opportunities with you all. Um, so I'll share these in the chat now um, in case you have to run off. Um, so just going to copy these links. Lots of links today, everyone, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to share these ones. And um, so I'll just change my slides as well. Um, so Tanya is online with us today. Um, Tanya is a director at the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, or ACAN, um, and she's a member of our network here and also a member on our forum. Um, and so she's online to have a quick chat with you all about um, an upcoming, upcoming opportunity for the Australasian Research Management Society Conference. Um, did you want to take yourself off mute, Tanya, and um, just have a quick chat about this? Oh, maybe the mute. Thank you. I've got it now. Oh, no, I'm yay. Here. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. No um, that was a really great session. So just very quickly, um, ARMS uh, exists for people who support research. So for all of those, all of us who work with researchers and help to design and implement research, um, this year's conference is going to be in Sydney. And in particular, I'm really interested in getting in touch with somebody who's based in Sydney uh, with an understanding in particular of open access and the important to, importance of the um, to the community sector for open access data uh, and the integrity uh, of around that. Um, there's a real push in the academic sphere for open access. Some people are braver than others, and I'd really love um, to, reach, uh, to reach somebody maybe from this network who would be interested in being on a panel at this conference. So please get in touch if you think um, that might be you or somebody from your organisation or team. Um, uh, there's lots of ways that that can uh, turn out, so don't feel like you're committed to anything just yet, uh, but would love to have that conversation. So as I, as Amy said, I'm on the QCOS network, the Teams group, um, otherwise my email is in the chat. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Tanya. It's good to actually meet you face to face, well, online face to face. Um, yeah, so like Tanya said, uh, her contact details. The 
uh, in the chat. And um, yeah, I look at the conference program. It looks like a really great conference. I, I'd never actually heard of ARMS before. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that and um, re reaching out to us as well. Um, there's another opportunity on the 10th to 12th of May, um, which is the Australasian Ethics Network. Um, and they're also planning a conference um, in Melbourne. Um, so I've, I've shared the links to all of these different details. Um, I don't have a slide for that one. Um, we've also got on the 20th of March, um, QCOS is launching a blueprint to tackle Queensland's housing crisis. Um, it's a discussion with Hal Pawson over the, um, of the UNSW City Futures uh, Research Centre. Um, and so the webinar will cover data outlining particular regional housing needs, uh, literature review and statistical analysis of housing need in Queensland um, and policy solutions to resolve Queensland's housing crisis. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, it's a webinar covering, you know, a hundred page report. So um, can register like I have. Um, the next opportunity is in 28th uh, of March um, and Stacey who coordinates our quality collaboration network. Um, so in collaboration with uh, Info Exchange, um, she's hosting a cybersecurity webinar. So if cybersecurity is your thing, you know, I recommend you can um, sign up to that webinar. Um, also on the, sorry, I'll just change it over the slide. On the 4th of April, the Australian Evaluation Society um, is hosting a half day workshop webinar around writing powerful articles for publication. Um, so I thought it was appropriate to share given the topic uh, of today. Um, it is limited to 25 participants. So I'd suggest getting in quick for that workshop. Um, I registered yesterday and there were still places available. So see how, if you can, if you're interested, register. Um, and our next, Next network uh, webinar, like I mentioned, is on the 4th of April. Um, and so it's around data governance in the community services sector. And I will send out an email um, out when registrations are live on our website. Um, and that's all for me. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today, um, online and engaging in today's discussion. I'm just going to launch a few polls now um, with the help of Michael, who is online um, providing our tech support. So um, yeah, thank you all again for joining us. It's been great. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week and um, look forward to connecting in April. Take care.